Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a Vox Markets webinar in partnership with Turner Pope. This evening, we have Dr. Cliff Holloway, CEO of ScanCell. He'll be taking us through the group's current presentation, and then we'll be taking some questions at the end. If you have a question you'd like to ask along the way, please use the comment box on the right and we'll try to get around to them. I'll now hand you over to Cliff and see you at the end. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cliff Holloway. It's my pleasure to give you this brief introduction to ScanCell. I'd first like to draw your attention to our disclaimer notice. So ScanCell is operating at the forefront of this very exciting field of immunotherapy. That is therapies that harness the body's immune system to fight disease. This is one of the most rapidly growing markets within the biopharmaceutical industry. And ScanCell has three platform technologies, Immunibody, Moditope, and Avidimab, that we believe have the potential to address the unmet needs in the treatment of cancer and also infectious disease such as COVID-19. The company did a transformational fundraise towards the end of 2020, raising 48 million pounds with 40 of that coming from a specialty healthcare fund called Red Mile Group based in the United States. And that funding now allows us to extend our runway to broaden the utility of our platform technologies and to accelerate and the development pipeline, but more importantly, to accelerate our products into the clinic. And we have three clinical studies planned throughout 2021. There's a phase two study in malignant melanoma, and then we have a phase one, two study being prepared in multiple cancer indications. And then there's the first assessment in man for our second generation COVID-19 vaccine. The company was founded by Professor Lindy Durrant, and we have 27 employees divided between two sites in Oxford and Nottingham, and we are AIM listed. So in summary, we have three platform technologies, four lead products targeting multiple cancer indications, as well as COVID-19. So this is our development pipeline. And as you can see, there's a lot going on for a small company. So I'll try and get through this as much as possible in the short time available. So let's just focus on our immunobody platform to start with. So we have two immunobody products, SCIB1 and SCIB2. SCIB1 being the most advanced, it's completed a phase one, two clinical study and then now entering phase two. And then SCIB2 is in preclinical development. And then related to this platform is our development of a COVID-19 vaccine. So what is an immunobody? So immunobodies are plasmid DNA, and many of you now will be familiar with the concept of DNA and RNA vaccines that translate genetic information um, to produce protein antigens that stimulate an immune response. And that's exactly what we do with this platform. However, we do this in a unique way. Our DNA translates to this Y-shaped antibody framework molecule, um, which we integrate the cancer or the viral antigens into the arms of that Y-shape. And that has a unique mechanism of action. It allows us to do direct presentation of those antigens to the antigen presenting cells, but also cross presentation. And it's that dual mode of action that induces these very potent T cell responses. So the T cells are like the soldiers of our immune system. Their job is to identify, target and kill the disease cell. And so we almost train these to be like the elite troops where they're far more efficient at this role. So as I mentioned, we have a SCIB1 has completed a phase one, two clinical study. Uh, we treated two cohorts of patients in that study in malignant melanoma. One group of patients had measurable disease and we could see an impact as a monotherapy on um, lesions in the lung. And then we also treated a, a group of patients who had resected disease. And in that group, in the majority of those patients, we were able to prevent the recurrence of disease over a period of five years. So what that is telling us is that we're inducing an immune response that has an impact on existing disease, but also invoking an immunological memory response that can prevent the recurrence of disease over a long period of time. SCIB2 is for targeting solid tumors, so a range of tumors expressing NYESO1. And as I mentioned, we've adapted this immunobody approach uh, to target SARS-CoV-2 antigens, the N protein and also the S protein. And this is a highly differentiated approach to COVID-19. We've also integrated into this platform now a modification utilizing our Abidimab platform. And this is a modification to the trunk of the um, Y-shaped molecule, the FC portion. And that helps to boost even further the immune response. So we get higher avidity um, uh, T cell responses by utilizing this modification. And that has the added advantage of also 
um, extending the patent life on the resulting immunobodies incorporating this modification. So when we look at the immuno-oncology landscape, this market is really being driven by the success of a group of products called checkpoint inhibitors, such as Keytruda. Keytruda sales grew about 30% last year to an amount of 14.4 billion US dollars. So they're now established uh, as standard of care in many, many cancer types. However, they're not a panacea. Response rates and duration of response will vary from cancer to cancer and also from patient to patient. So the race is on now to find optimum combination therapies that can increase the eligible patient population who will respond and have long-term survival on these types of therapies. And this is exactly the strategy that we're now embarking on with our SCID1 product. So we're now going into late stage melanoma in patients with unresectable disease. So, and we're enhancing the overall immune response to the checkpoint inhibitor. So that's typically 30% response uh, in this patient cohort to Keytruda. And we've powered the study to try and uh, identify a clinical signal where we can boost that response to 55%. So we're in the process now of opening up new clinical centers as the NHS becomes more uh, open to non-COVID related activities. We have four clinical centers identified in the UK and we are expecting to add additional sites as we step through the year. And we anticipate that based on that recruitment rate, that we should see interim data come from this study in the first half of 2022. So as I mentioned, you know, from uh, our experience in how we treat melanoma, we've adapted that approach in inducing these high avidity T cell responses to COVID-19. And we've done that in a unique way in a highly differentiated cancer vaccine. So this is a DNA plasmid vaccine that induces T cell responses against the N protein, that's the nuclear capsid protein that's inside the virus, but also inducing these neutralizing antibody responses to the S protein, which is a spike on the surface of the um, virus. So that has a dual immune response where we're getting a prevent and clearance. So the neutralizing antibody, preventing the virus from entering cells and infecting them, but also that powerful T cell response I referred to is now clearing virally infected cells. And by targeting two antigens, we're getting a much broader immune response. And the N protein in particular doesn't mutate as rapidly as the S protein. So we believe that the immune response we're eliciting here could have potential protection against existing and future variants of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we're now expand expanding the study into the clinic. We anticipate starting a clinical assessment as soon as possible during this year. And if we can tick the box on the safety assessment initially, uh, we expect a rapid um, uh, evolution of this product into a phase two study to assess efficacy. And we also received a small grant from um, Innovate UK to advance this product into the clinic. Now just to draw your attention to our Moditope platform. So we have two Moditope vaccines in development, Modi1 and Modi2. And we also have a research collaboration with a um, large biotech company called BioNTech based in Germany, where we're trying to identify the T cell receptors that also recognize the Modi1 epitopes that we've incorporated into that product. So the Moditope platform is exploiting the metabolic differences between cancer and normal cells. And we're targeting what we call stress-induced post-translational modifications. Now that's a lot to take in, so let me try and explain that. So in, if you can imagine the cancer cell, it's rapidly dividing. So we're forming these bulky tumors, rapidly dividing cells that become oxygen deprived, nutrient deprived because the blood supply just cannot keep up with the growth of the tumor. And this invokes a stress mechanism called autophagy. And autophagy is the cellular breakdown of cellular proteins, cytoskeletal proteins. And during that process, you get conversion of natural amino acids to unnatural amino acids. So the inventive step that ScanCell took was to A, recognize this process um, is taking place within cancer cells, but then to identify and characterize these unique protein peptide fragments that are a result of this breakdown process and then inducing them to be expressed on the surface of the cancer cell because they're highly immunogenic and induce a very potent CD4 cytotoxic C, uh, T cell response. And all our preclinical data points to this as a very powerful mechanism uh, to eradicating cancer cells. 
So we now have identified several of these peptide fragments based on citronation. So this is the conversion of arginine to citronine. And then we also have another product targeting another process where we're looking at the conversion of lysine to homocitronine. So our first product, MODI1, comprises of several peptides, citronated peptides, um, that induce these powerful immune responses. We further boost that immune response by conjugating them with an adjuvant called Amplibet. And we've tested this in numerous models, um, and we're now looking to translate that data now to the clinic. So our first in human study is planned for later this year. We anticipate initiating the study next quarter, where we're actually looking at four separate cancer indications. So we'll initially go through a dose escalation phase to assess safety of the product. And then we will be targeting four separate cohorts of patients in triple negative breast cancer, ovarian cancer, renal cancer, and also head and neck cancer. And each of these cohorts are powered for a clinical signal. So this is almost like four clinical studies in one. And of course, if we hit across all four of those uh, clinical signals and achieve the endpoints, then we'll have you know, obviously a product that is, can be broadly applied to the treatment of cancer. But a clinical signal in any one of these indications would be a great result, um, given that these are all very hard to treat cancers. So now moving on to our antibody platform. And we have um, a panel of monoclonal antibodies. Antibodies, as you may know, are well established as therapeutics within the industry, not just in cancer, but also in the treatment of infectious and also autoimmune diseases. So this is a massive market estimated to be well over 150 billion US uh, worldwide. And what we have is targeting unique uh, targets like glycans and glycans are unique in the sense that most antibodies only target protein um, targets such as um, uh, in the in, uh, uh, regulated targets in cancer and autoimmune diseases and what we're doing in uh, this case is targeting these sugar signatures that differentiate cancer versus a normal cell and glycans are involved in numerous biological processes such as cell trafficking and cell proliferation and the beauty of these targets is that they can be attached to either lipids or also to proteins. And the unique mode of action, depending on whether it's a glycolipid or a glycoprotein, we can utilize these antibodies in several modalities. So our, our objective right now is to evaluate these uh, monoclonal antibodies targeting these unique uh, glycan signatures in several uh, aspects. So for example, antibody drug conjugates, this is where the antibody internalizes inside the cancer cell and we can attach a cytotoxic agent um, that can kill the cancer cell and also the adjacent cells. And this is an area of intense commercial interest now within the industry. There's been a lot of commercial deals around antibody drug conjugates. And we really believe that now that by advancing these products further forward into the preclinical assessment in this modality that we can add additional value to these assets and then transact them at a later stage in the development process. And we'll also assess the capabilities as potentially into CAR-T, which is adoptive cell therapy methodologies, as well as direct cell killing antibodies utilizing our abidumab technology. So the Avidimab technology, which um, uh, is a unique platform technology I mentioned earlier. Um, and this is a modification to the trunk of the antibody, the FC portion. And what we do is be able to aggregate these antibodies non-covalently around the target of interest. And that adds to the potency of the resulting antibody. So its occupancy on the cell surface uh, around the target of choice um, is the on rate is much uh, longer than, uh, than normal. And that adds to the potency. And this is not something that we can just apply to our own antibodies. This potentially could be applied to any monoclonal antibody. Uh, and this has been peer reviewed in the Cancer Research Journal uh, and a publication uh, in the middle of last year. Uh, and it's interesting that we adapted this technology into our COVID-19 vaccine uh, to enhance that immune response to, I referred to earlier. And that has now translated back to our cancer vaccines. So as you can see, we're fundamentally an immunology, immunology company. So our work in cancer translated into infectious diseases. And now some of the modifications that we've adapted into our COVID-19 vaccine now is translating back to our cancer vaccines. 
So I mentioned that we did this transformational uh, fundraise in the latter half of 2020. And we did that fundraise in two cohorts. So in August, we raised um, 15 million pounds, uh, 10 of that coming from Red Mile Group. Uh, and then we had a convertible uh, loan from both Red Mile and Volfus. Uh, and then a placement that was oversubscribed of 2 million plus an open offer that was also oversubscribed of 2 million. And then shortly after that fundraising, Red Mile um, decided that they would see a better potential of our platform technologies by having a stronger cash balance and a longer cash runway. So they decided that they would like to invest further and we raised another 33 million pounds, 30 of that coming from Red Mile as a subscription and also as a convertible loan, uh, plus another open offer to existing shareholders, which was oversubscribed. So in total, the company raised 48 million pounds in the latter half of 2022. And this is transformational. This has given the company now the ability to extend our runway to advance our products, but also to build out our resources. So when we look at deploying this capital, we're looking to obviously advance our products now through the clinic in those three clinical studies I just described earlier, but also now to broaden our capabilities to execute on that strategy. So one of the first hires we did on the back of this financing was to appoint a chief medical officer, um, Dr. Gillies O'Brien Tier and then Robert Miller as a medical director in November. And that's particularly important as we expand our, uh, or advance our products into the clinic throughout this year and beyond. And then we're also in the process of establishing a translational research and development laboratory in Oxford. And that will complement the core research activities of uh, Professor Durant's uh, core research group in the University of Nottingham. This also allows us now to uh, ex extend our antibody platform and, and to evaluate further our antibodies as ADCs and also in other modalities I referred to earlier. So we can advance these products further forward and add value uh, so that when we get to a point where we'll transact these antibodies, we expect to see um, significant value inflection on, on the new work that we'll be undertaking over the next year or two. This also allows us also to supplement our activity in COVID-19. As I mentioned, we received a small grant from Innovate UK. Uh, that will get us into the clinic, but to go and beyond that, we obviously will be looking to supplement that activity, but also we'll be seeking a commercial partner to take this product beyond the initial clinical study I referred to earlier. So this is transformational. Red Mile, as I mentioned, was a large US-based uh, specialty healthcare group. I think this is fantastic validation for scan cell science and for the direction the company's taking. Uh, and we see them as being a strategic investor um, for some time to come. So when we look at the anticipated news flow in the short to medium term, as I mentioned, when it comes to immunobody, it's about expanding SCID1 into the study, the phase two study I referred to earlier, and getting the, activating those clinical centers and getting to that interim clinical data in the early part of 2022. The same for Moditope, advancing Modi1 into this first in human study planned for the first half of this year. Uh, and then also seeing um, the uh, interim data from that study potentially coming out again in the second, uh, in the first half of 2022. When it comes to avidimab and the um, tumor associated glycan antibodies, this is really about extending the patent portfolio, but also ex uh, exploring their utility in all those modalities and adding value to those assets uh, for future transactions. And then COVID-19 again, it's about getting that product into the clinic, first clinical assessment, and then expanding that as quickly as possible into a phase two efficacy study. Uh, and then also we'll obviously in parallel to that activity be seeking a commercial partner to advance that, and, uh, that um, vaccine forward um, if that first clinical assessment is successful. So when we summarize our activities over the next few years, it really comes down to five core activities. As I mentioned, clinical data is the data that's really gonna drive value for the company, but it's also now having the runway to expand our utility of our platform technologies and expand our platform and pipeline, um, not just in the cancer vaccine arena, but also across our antibody portfolio but also finding those technology partnerships to de-risk the development and bringing in new technologies that can um, a, enable our products to be delivered correctly and also um, uh, and the adjuvant technologies I mentioned um, for our Modi One product 
and other products that will be coming forward within that platform. And then those clinical partnerships to identify the clinical utility of our products and getting into the clinical networks to ensure that we can understand how our products can be deployed in real clinical settings. But importantly, establishing relationships with industry partners who will ultimately be taking these products forward into the market. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Hello all, thank you for that great presentation, Cliff. Uh, and thank you to any of those who sent in any questions, we'll try and cover them. Um, so Cliff, the company is clearly operating within a really exciting and interesting space. Um, and now this might seem like a bit of an obvious question after that presentation, but what I wanted to ask was, what was the first thing that you would say really kickstarted what you have now described as such a transformative period? No, that's a good question. Thanks, Fran. Uh, I would say that the point that really uh, was a turning point was uh, the day that we closed the second tranche of the financing at the end of 2020. No, and I say that because that's now given us a very clear visibility and a cash runway now to execute our strategy. It's, it's far more efficient in terms of how we can now execute and taking our programs through the clinic, knowing that we have the capital resources you know, to, uh, to, you know, to, to see that through. Um, you know, in the past that we've been very much in a sort of a drip feed of financing and that's always, you know, an inefficient way to conduct clinical studies in particular. So I think, you know, as I said, you know, having that visibility in a cash runway now has really sort of given us, you know, a, a very clear uh, view as to how we can now you know, sort of bring our products and get to those endpoints. That's great. And alongside having this clearer visibility, can you tell us more about what the significance is of receiving funding from a large US-based company like Redmar Group? And currently, what is your ongoing relationship like with them? Right. So, so Red Mile came in, as, we, as I said in the presentation, initially in uh, August of last year. And you know, they are a very large, they have over $6 billion under management. And of course, a fantastic track record in recognizing and you know, getting returns for their investors, but also recognizing companies like ScanCell and you know, uh, seeing the, the, the future valuation inflections that can be realized. Uh, so they obviously have come to the table in terms of um, a strategic investor, if you like, where they're not just bringing capital to the table, but also you know, a very uh, <laughs> significant uh, relationships, not just within the financial community, but also within the pharmaceutical industry uh, and beyond. So we certainly have a great relationship with them. I see them as being a long-term and uh, a very strategic investor and will one that would, I think, um, you know, will benefit all shareholders going forward. That's great. And I'm sure everyone is really interested in the COVID side of things. So we'll jump into that straight away. Um, of course, we're all aware that currently multiple vaccines are being rolled out globally mm -hmm. and the company is in the process of developing what is known as a second generation vaccine. Can you explain a bit more about what this really means and how the company sees itself operating alongside the large players that are already within this space? Right, yeah, so, so we call ourselves a second generation vaccine because obviously we're coming into this with a very different approach to the previous players. Now we're a cancer company and we came into infectious disease. As I said in the presentation, we're fundamentally an immunology company, a vaccine is a vaccine. Uh, but you know, we've taken a very, very differentiated approach. And I think the, the value that we're bringing to the table, and certainly that's now becoming more apparent as the spotlight now is directed towards these new variants. So I certainly think there's a role um, to be played for a new vaccine coming into the market. I don't think that the fact that there will be a vaccinated population can uh, preempt uh, new vaccines coming in and actually acting as a boost. So if uh, people have already been previously immunized, that doesn't prevent a new vaccine coming in and actually adding a boost, particularly if these new variants become more prevalent in the community. Uh, certainly when it comes to the larger players, you know, who have uh, missed that first wave of vaccines coming into the marketplace, and of course we're all familiar with the, the players that are already there, like AstraZeneca and Pfizer, there are a number of larger players that have missed that first wave, uh, are certainly looking for new technologies and new solutions to this uh, pandemic. And um, what, what can you say about the current timing and process of the vaccine candidate? 
Um, yes, no, so we've communicated that we're going to start a clinical study as soon as possible during 2021. And this will be the first uh, in human study to assess safety. And we're looking at the uh, titers, if you like, of the antibody response and the um, T cell response that we can see in humans and how that would then translate to an efficacy study, which will be the next phase. So, you know, there are a number of moving parts in terms of how you move, uh, move into a clinical study. But what I can say is that we do expect to have at least some of that clinical data within this calendar year, certainly from the initial cohorts in that study. And, um, and you know, we are obviously looking to advance the program into an efficacy study as soon as possible as well. And what can you say on the financial side of things in terms of seeing the trials through? Right. No. So certainly for this initial phase study, no, that, that is in our budget. Um, now, as I mentioned in the presentation, we received a small grant from uh, Innovate UK, and that's also going towards um, the execution of that initial clinical study. And I think on the back of that data that we will be looking to partner this, this program with a larger player. Of course, this is a huge problem in scalability in terms of large clinical studies and also scalability of manufacturing. It's gonna need someone else to do a lot of the heavy lifting to, to execute on that strategy. So we will be looking to partner this program and uh, we will need to do that rather sooner than later on the back of this initial clinical data. That's great, thanks for outlining that. Um, now you recently announced that you were expanding the team with new board appointments. Can you touch on how these appointments will benefit the company and its strategy over the coming months? Right, um, so as this uh, I think might be directed towards the appointment of our chief medical officer and, uh, and medical director. director, yeah, coming into the study, uh, into the clinic, uh, sorry, into our, our company. So uh, Gillies O'Brien here and um, Robert Miller are both seasoned professionals within the pharmaceutical industry, both within big pharma and small biotech. And of course, they're bringing in an industry perspective in terms of how we can execute our clinical programs. Now, we do have a clinical advisory board, and, and that's extremely useful in terms of understanding the clinical utility of our programs in real clinical settings. But we need to have that medical expertise with a, a lens of looking from inside the company outside, but with a commercial hat on. Uh, so Gillies in particular has been involved in many successful companies. He's got big farmer experience, uh, the most recent small biotech uh, or I'm saying, uh, rather, relatively small biotech he was involved in was a company called Algita that was acquired by Bayer uh, a few years ago for 2.9 billion um, US dollars. So uh, now again, you know, a seasoned professional, both on the clinical development side, but also with a good commercial head as well. That's great. Now, in line with this, you mentioned in the presentation that the board wishes to broaden the group's capabilities, particularly in reference to its strategy. Uh, when saying this, do you mean specifically in terms of new technologies or new early stage developments of drugs for different indications? What do you mean by this? Uh, it, it's all the above, really. But certainly initially, it's about capabilities in terms of being able to execute the strategy. So as I mentioned in the presentation, we're actually building a, a laboratory here in Oxford you know, that will uh, complement the activities in our research centre in Nottingham. So that's translational and developmental capabilities. So up till now, we've outsourced a lot of that um, activity to other uh, uh, you know, CROs. Um, and you know, there's an inefficiency in doing that. I and mean, certainly being in control of our own destiny is a, certainly an advantage. So that's, I think, will have a significant uh, capabilities in enabling us to execute on our clinical uh, strategy and also um, the earlier stage programs too. But then on the other flip side of that is the technologies that what I call enabling technologies that do risk our programs and uh, having the capabilities internally now to execute on that, for example, as I mentioned, in terms of delivery of our, our products, you know, particularly our DNA plasmid products, um, and also um, products that uh, or technologies that can enhance the immune response within our uh, Modito programs. Uh, and then there's those enabling technologies as we advance our antibodies through the preclinical trajectory in the uh, field of antibody drug conjugates. So this is linker and payload technologies. So this has opened up a whole new panacea of opportunity for the company. That's great. And can you expand on these opportunities in terms of executing new technologies? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, there are, there are a number of things that we need to do now to bring our products forward. Um, you know, those, those products are already in the clinic, then obviously we've already got relationships with other companies you know, to execute on that and you know, licensing uh, of those technologies. But then there are new technologies and you know, that are available that you know, will add improvements to our programs. And I think we're now in a unique position to entertain 
uh, bringing some of those new technologies into the company would add a further efficiency um, to the products and also enhance their capabilities in the clinic. That's great. Now, some, some believe that, you know, true success comes with partnerships with big pharma companies. Can you say anything about this and whether or not Scancell is in any current or early discussions with companies of this nature? No, okay, no, that's a good question. And unashamedly, that is, you know, a direction that we need to take. Uh, we're not going to be a company that will advance our products into the market without a partner. Um, so, you know, we want to do all the heavy lifting, get to the clinic, you know, proof of concept or proof of relevance, if you like, uh, in the clinic. But then, you know, to go into those larger clinical studies and into the market, that is going to require a larger player. So, of course, we do keep um, dialogue going with a number of those companies that, that we think would be uh, well suited to advancing our products into the market. Uh, they have obviously keep a very close eye on what we're doing. Um, so yes, we do keep maintain a number of relationships like that, an ongoing dialogue. And then of course we participate in a number of conferences and via partnering uh, discussions uh, so that we can keep these uh, potential partners aware of all our activities. That's great. And looking ahead and also in reference to product developments, what would you say are some key milestones for this year and next that will keep both short and long-term investors interested? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So as I mentioned, you know, the clinical data is what's going to drive value for this company. So here we are now in a position now we can execute three clinical studies throughout um, 2021. And that means data is coming and data is going to drive value. So I certainly think that as we step through 2021, as we initiate those clinical studies, obviously that would mean that in the early half of 2022, uh, and as I mentioned in the presentation, we anticipate that we'll see interim data flow out of that. But these are so-called um, open label studies so that we can actually see the data as, as, as the programs are being executed. Uh, so that interim data will tell us a lot, um, and it'll certainly be something that we will be also informing of those potential partners uh, I mentioned as well. Uh, and the COVID-19 vaccine, because this is an initial phase one study, I think we'll have initial data this year. And I think that data is going to be important in terms of how we then interact with a potential partner to take that program further forward as well. And then when it comes to the antibodies, um, you know, we have had commercial interest in our antibodies uh, previously. Um, you know, we decided that with uh, on the back of the new financing that we wanted to advance these further forward and add value. But there is still already, um, as I mentioned, you know, some commercial interest, and that doesn't necessarily mean that um, that we won't uh, be thinking about you know, other relationships in terms of how we might bring those partners and, uh, and assist us in terms of how we might take those products forward as well. That's great. Thank you so much, Cliff. Um, you, you've got a lot in a very interesting space, and um, I think both the COVID and cancer side are really, really um, great opportunity um, and I'm sure everyone listening will be interested to see where the company goes and if it achieves its uh, three milestones this year. Great thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to uh, further, uh, uh, hopefully another opportunity like this in the future. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank All you right. so much for joining us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.